Hare Krishna. So extremely sorry for the delay. We got caught in the traffic. And grateful to be here amongst all of you. As is mentioned, I'll speak on the topic of loneliness. And why we experience it and what we can do about it. I'll talk about it three levels. Circumstantial psychological and spiritual before that let me begin with uh, a couple of experiences from my life uh, when I was in college I just entered into college at that time I was about 14 15 just finished my school I had got a very good grade in my school I was among the top students in my in my state of Maharashtra in India and then somehow on the very day on which uh, I got that result, my mother was diagnosed with advanced blood cancer, leukemia. And it was so advanced that within one month, she passed away. So at that time, it was, I felt deeply lonely. Although I had a younger brother, I had my father. My father was working in a different city. My younger brother was almost 12 years younger to me. So that was the time I started thinking, uh, what is it that uh, we look for when we are lonely? It's obviously that we are looking for uh, someone whom we love, someone whom we can relate with. And their absence creates a sense of emptiness, a sense of hollowness within us. A sense of loneliness but then I started thinking that actually death is going to come to everyone some people get it younger some people get it older so is it that when we form relationships and then we experience loss thereafter so are we simply doomed to suffer sometimes some relationship work out for a whole lifetime Sometimes they work for a shorter time, but eventually they all end. So what was the point of it all? And that, so that question was what one of, the, one of the questions that made me start looking for the purpose of life. What is life meant for? What are relationships meant for? What is everything meant for? And at that time, I read, uh, I came across after a couple of years of re reading various books, I came across the Bhagavad Gita. And the Bhagavad Gita is an ancient yoga text which explains how we all are essentially relational creatures. We are at our core spiritual beings. But we are all meant to be in relationships. That is our eternal nature. So the Bhagavad Gita explains that we have two kinds of relationships. One is horizontal relationship with others around us. And there is, the other is a vertical relationship with the divine. The divine is known by different names in different traditions. And the process of connecting with the divine is called the yoga of love or bhakti yoga. Yoga normally we do for physical fitness and physical health. Uh, so the, the yoga which relates not just with the body but with the heart. The yoga of the heart, the yoga of love is called as Bhakti Yoga. And Bhakti Yoga centers on developing our vertical relationship with the Divine. As I said, the Divine is known by different names in different traditions. And the Bhagavad Gita knows the Divine by the name Krishna. The word Krishna means one who is all attractive one who is the source of the attractiveness of everyone so the bhakti yoga texts describe the beauty and the glory of Krishna and in one such bhakti yoga text I found it is called the Srimad Bhagavatam as I was continuing my reading I found a very striking passage where there is a mother who wants to help her child 
who has been insulted his boy dhruva has been severely insulted by his stepmother and his father is silent and because her father because this because her uh, her father uh, this boy's dhruva's father she is circumstantially not able to help dhruva so at that time she tells him pray to vishnu vishnu is another name of god pray to krishna and there she says that whatever love i can offer you or whatever love millions of mothers like me can offer you he says krishna can offer you that much and more love so this was very striking observation for me now that means the love that we experience in our relationships is real it is some sometimes in the spiritual path some people hold the idea that actually ultimately we are all just to merge into oneness we just have to become peaceful we become apathetic detached from everything so the idea is that all relationships are temporary so they are illusory so don't get entangled some people have that idea of spirituality just go into a state of secluded isolation and trance but what this was what this passage states is that if if the divine love is thousands of times more than the love that we experience that means that the love that we experience is also real now if the love that we experience now is illusory is false if it is zero then zero multiplied by thousands is also zero only so then i came across a whole complete world view what that world view states says that we as i said we have a vertical relationship with the divine and we have horizontal relationship with others and for our life journey to move steadily we need both these relationships we need the vertical relationship and we need the horizontal relationship now the horizontal relationships are the horizontal relationships are what we normally seek when we want relationships and in these relationships if we find that some upheaval comes up some turbulence comes up some disruption happens then it often becomes unbearable if we have defined ourselves if we have defined ourselves in terms of that relationship what do i mean by define ourselves in terms of that that relationship see we all have our own self understanding of who we are it may be okay i am an american i am i am i am an engineer i am a pro- i am a professional a lawyer i am young i am we all have our self definitions and our self definitions our self understanding is based not just on the qualifications that we have or the nationality that we have we also form our self definition based on the relationships that we have so for example we may identify ourselves as the son or daughter of some so and so when we are small uh, then as we grow up we may identify ourselves as okay i am the husband of this person and the wife of this person then as we grow further we have kids we may identify ourselves i am the mother of this person i am the father of this person and each of these relationships they bring a sense of they form an important layer in our identity but if any of these relationships become our defining identity then we can face severe disturbance of the mind when that relationship gets disrupted so loneliness it happens when not just when we are alone in fact when we are alone we just all alone maybe we are in a forest somewhere and there's nobody around or we are caught on an island where there's nobody around that can be circumstantial loneliness where we are circumstantially not with people but the most 
mortifying the most painful loneliness is when we are surrounded by people and we feel lonely actually when we feel lonely and we are physically also alone that time we just go and meet with people connect with people and then loneliness goes away but when we are with others and still we feel complete we feel lonely we feel forlorn we feel disconnected that loneliness is very very difficult to deal with so that so that loneliness happens when we are largely when we are defining ourselves in terms of a particular relationship say for example a child is defined in terms of the relationship with the parents so if a child has no parents then the child is defined as a orphan if somebody is married and lost their spouse then they may be defined as a widow as a widower now here what has happened in all these situations the social identity is in terms of the loss that okay this is a orphan this is like this, this is like this that is social ident social identification might be there but what is the way the person personally identifies themselves if they keep identifying themselves in terms of that loss that thing which is missing in their life then that is if they feel a relationship is a part of my defining identity or rather is my defining identity and then that relationship is lacking then they feel extremely lonely so somebody might be been very close to their sibling and if then suddenly they get separated from their sibling they might feel lonely because of that we all have different relationships but whichever relationship becomes a part of our defining identity and then we experience disconnection in that relationship that's when we feel the greatest loneliness uh, i've been giving seminars on fear and over facing our fears across various colleges and companies so while i was studying about fear i looked at what are the various fears that people experienced through a, through history say what are the top 10 fears of people in the 18th century top 10 fears in the 19th century top 10 fears in the 20th century top 10 fears in the 21st century so in the 21st century two fears have become added to the list one fear is the fear of terrorists which is understandable hmm? fear of terrorists and the second fear is interesting the second fear is the fear of rejection and when people want to form a relationship with someone and they are afraid that they will experience rejection in that relationship that also causes great fear now if you consider these two fears of the fear of rejection is actually a fear of loneliness that i form a relationship and i get rejected then i'll be left lonely and that loneliness so that it's, it's such a great fear it has become practically among the top 10 fears i was in uk just 4 uh, months ago and i was speaking on a similar topic of of depression and one of the causes of course is loneliness so the uh, i read over there that actually the U, U, the uk government has appointed a official minister for loneliness Now how to deal with loneliness now that is because this is such a serious problem so i was saying that we have horizontal relationships and among the various relationships some relationships become a part of our self definition and when that defining relationship is experiencing some turbulence that is when we become lonely so this is what is psychological loneliness psychological means circumstantially we are surrounded by people but that time we feel extremely lonely we feel isolated we feel desolate at such times at one level we may try to form another relationship okay if i form a relationship then that might help me to move on in my life but another way of looking at it is that we form not just another relationship but we also look to understand what is it that i am looking for what is it that defines me 
that means if you look at our horizontal relationship and our vertical relationship then as long as we define ourselves in terms of our horizontal relationships we don't have control over whether people will be there with us physically or emotionally we don't know that if we define ourselves in terms of our relationships alone then a turbulence in the relationship will be unbearable for us oh and then how do we define ourselves broadly speaking now we may define define ourselves in terms of our relationships or we may define ourselves in terms of our positions and our professions oh i am so i am a software engineer i am an attorney i am this and that now the, the defining ourselves in terms of our positions helps but it doesn't help us in a significant way because that doesn't lead to a connection of the heart let me i talk about what i mean by a connection of the heart this vertical relationship which we have that is based on the understanding that god the divine krishna as is known in the bhakti yoga tradition that he is always with us the bhakti the bhagavad gita explains that the divine is always present within our hearts he is with us always and if we turn towards that divine in the mood of devotion then we can experience some sublime calm some sublime joy when we do the kirtan that we are doing right now that is one way of connecting with the divine of experiencing a presence of the divine and by connecting with the divine that relationship is a eternally stable relationship why is it eternally stable because the divine never forsakes us because that divine the love of the divine for love of krishna the love of divine for us is not conditional it is not that we have to be someone special to be loved by the divine rather we are special because we are loved by the divine irrespective of who we are now we may say oh this is all just is nice sounding fantasy how do i really know that there's someone and there's someone love for us so we are at a particular level of consciousness and at a, at our level of consciousness we can perceive things according to that level only if a baby is newborn and the baby starts crying when the baby is crying the mother may pick up the baby and offer her a breast milk now when the baby is drinking the breast milk initially she may be so disoriented she doesn't even know that there is my there is this mother and this mother is offering me her breast milk all that she feels is that oh she is some some nice soft object is there i i get something nice soft out of it and as she keeps drinking that milk drinking that milk over a period of time she starts becoming aware oh, okay actually this is a person over here and this person loves me with this person i am safe with this person i am protected and then as that baby starts growing up then say if at night suddenly it becomes very cold and the baby starts shivering baby is asleep eyes are closed but starts shivering sometimes we are in a semi awake and semi asleep state when we are slightly aware of the things around us but we are not where our eyes are not open and we are not fully awake so for example if at night it's very cold we may not wake up but if we feel feel like sleeping then we might look around is there a comforter nearby and we might put the comforter on us so suppose the mother sees this baby is trembling she may be shivering and the mother comes and puts a comforter on the baby now the baby has not opened her eyes she has not seen her mother but just by feeling the warmth of the comforter the baby understands oh my mother is here my mother cares for me my mother loves me my mother has put this comfort on me so that means there there is no vision of the mother but there is the experience of comfort of warmth of coziness 
from which there is an inference that this is my mother and my mother is expressing her love for me through this action. Similarly for us, just like that baby is sleeping, right now we are all in a, in a, in a state of spiritual unconsciousness. Spiritual unconsciousness means that although there is a spiritual core to us which is indestructible, we are not aware of that spiritual core. To continue with that mother and child example, say suppose there is a child who is watching a horror movie. And the child is watching the horror movie. It's so horrified. It's maybe trembling, shivering, scared, actually. More and more horrified. Now the child is so caught in that horror movie, the mother sees. The child is there, the child is, the child is horrified. Now actually nothing has happened to the child. But as long as the child is caught in the horror movie, a child can't perceive that all that is happening is simply a movie. Now we may watch a movie at home and it doesn't cost that much. But if you go to theater and watch the movie, in the theater, we pay much more to watch the movie. <laughs> what happens? In the theater, the illusion is greater. We want to experience it fully. So when we go into the theater, there are two things that happen. As soon as we enter into the theater, first the lights go off. So if the lights go off, then we can't see much around us. And then the lights go on. And then our consciousness gets completely caught on whatever is there on the screen. So even if there is somebody around us, if our consciousness is completely caught on the TV on that theater screen, we will not perceive anything else. Similarly for us, when we are practicing spiritual life, when we are sorry, when we are in our present state of consciousness, our consciousness is caught at a particular level. And although spiritually, we, uh, the divine Krishna is with us, but we are oblivious to that presence. So we are caught in the movie, that is the worldly reality around us. And we are not aware of the spiritual divinity that is right next to us. In this situation, the idea of the divine who loves us, whose presence can comfort us, all this can seem like just a just an illusion. But just as the baby with the closed eyes can experience the warmth, the comfort, from which the love can be inferred. Similarly for us, when we practice bhakti yoga, for example, right now what we are doing was mantra meditation. Using a mantra to meditate on divine sound. If we do like this, we experience a sublime presence. We start experiencing a no, the sublime presence later. Initially, we start experiencing a sense of calmness, a sense of serenity, a sense of clarity. And this itself is an indicator of some higher reality that we are contacting, that we are linking with. And that can contact with the higher reality can calm us down. When I first came to America a few years ago, several years ago, at that time I had gone to a university in Midwest and I spoke there on the topic of regulating our mental health, regulating, regulating our mental diet. It was to a vegetarian society. It's talking about just as we regulate our physical diet, we can regulate our, what we take in mentally also. So after that, a boy came to me and he told me that just before this class he was contemplating suicide. He had been in a relationship with a girl and that girl had broken up with him. So he was so devastated by that that he had been thinking of ending his own life. And he was walking along gloomily through the campus. At that time he came and he heard my class. He said, some, something within me said, he saw the poster or the program, I said, let me come and hear. So he said, after he heard the class, he had, I explained in that class how our mind is inside us. So, and the mind can often act as our enemy. 
how does it act as our enemy the mind is like a software program inside us and it keeps proposing certain ideas so based on our self definition say so if we are defined ourselves in terms of say no i am this person's spouse i'm this person's ch 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 child i'm this person's parent then if you are facing some turbulence in that relationship and the mind starts saying you are unworthy you are useless you are hopeless so the mind keeps speaking to us constantly and that nagging voice of the mind that is what actually creates the sense of loneliness it's not the other person's absence in our life it is our constant replaying oh this person is not there this person is not there this person is not there and i am so lonely i am bereaved i am lost no one cares for me it is that sense of loneliness which is amplified by the mind so he said i understood that actually it was the mind which was making me feel which was the, the mind which it is not that i wanted to end my life it was the mind which was saying end your life end your life so i told him that this is a uh, life saving spiritual insight that you got that your mind is different from you and if you can study the bhagavad gita regularly if you understand the process of bhakti yoga then you can better appreciate this difference between yourself and your mind i write on the bhagavad gita daily at a blog gitadaily.com and encourage him to read that on a daily basis and whenever i would come to america thereafter from india i would meet him and talk with him and during these talks i would find that he's totally becoming stable well situated in his career and last year when i had come i met him he told me that he had been in a similar situation he had been in a steady relationship with a girl and she had unilaterally unexpectedly broken up with him so he said as soon as i got the text message it said that you know i'm breaking up with you i don't want to talk with you i'm blocking your number don't try to contact me so it is a blow for him he just went straight to his room and there he shut the door pulled down the windows closed the drapes turned off the lights and in the meanwhile over the years uh, he said started practicing bhakti yoga one aspect of bhakti yoga is the kirtan that we were doing just now so he liked to play a violin and he liked to sing the hari krishna kirtan mantra so he told me that he picked up his violin and he started continuously doing kirtan for 6 hours alone in the darkness there was no one with him he was singing out calling out from his heart in a mood of prayer in a mood of intense longing and he felt at that time as i kept calling although it was completely dark around me i felt as if a light was shining within me i felt i was as if i was embraced by a comforting uplifting presence what could have been a very depressing experience it became an extremely enriching experience for me and this happened because he was able to connect with the divine so that connection is a matter of experience no uh, just as the child the baby infers from the comfort of the com comforter that there is my mother who loves me similarly when we practice the process of bhakti yoga when we chant mantras when we offer our heart in the mood of worship when we study the bhakti texts when you associate with spiritually minded bhakti practitioners we start experiencing a calm within us we start experiencing some depth some line presence within us and that presence is to us at our level of consciousness a pointer to the divine and to the extent we can develop this relationship this vertical relationship that will bring stability for us and with that inner stability then the horizontal relationship that we are developing we can approach them with greater perspective and greater 
maturity if we are in an ocean and there are waves coming a giant wave may come and just toss us far far away but if we are in the ocean and we are connected to somebody has thrown down a rope for us from the helicopter we are still in the ocean but the helicopter will stabilize us the helicopter will enable the helicopter rope that connection will ensure that even if the waves come they won't shake us that much we'll hold on to that rope and we'll stabilize ourselves so similarly for us that vertical relationship brings stability at the horizontal level there will be turbulences there will be storms to the extent that vertical relationship is there to that extent we will have inner stability our self identity comes from that vertical relationship we are eternally parts of the divine we are eternally loved by the divine and we are eternally graced by the divine presence within us we just have to become more aware of that and then when we have this inner security then when we form relationships we will form we will seek and form relationships based on a foundation of inner security not on the basis of inner insecurity there are broadly three ways in which we may form relationships we could have dependent relation we could have people who are dependent people who are independent and people who are interdependent it is people who are dependent their sense of self worth comes from someone other than themselves it is those people who are most vulnerable to feeling lonely when we are too dependent on others then uh, we need someone to keep reassuring us that you know that you are okay you are a good person they said there are different kinds of addictions there could be a substance addictions to drugs or to drinks or to cigarettes there can be behavioral addictions where somebody can be addicted to just screen surfing on the net screening as as but there can also be emotional addictions some people might have what is called a approval addiction unless somebody else approves me i feel as if i'm worthless for a child it might be a parent for a for somebody it might be their spouse they just constantly depend on other person for their approval and that makes them very insecure so this level of dependence is the level where we experience loneliness the bhagavad gita calls such a state of mind as a state of tamas the state of ignorance and it is when we connect with krishna through the process of bhakti yoga we realize that we are not dependent for our self identity or anyone else on anyone else for some dependence you can come to the level of independence independence doesn't mean that we don't care for others it just means that we don't depend on others for our self worth sometimes people feel that oh if i achieve something so if i come first in my class that will increase my self esteem yes that may help but real self esteem is that i don't they don't need to come first in my class to have a sense of self esteem that i am a part of the divine i am what i am meant to be i can improve myself but i don't need the world's laurels to give myself of self worth so when that level of independence comes by our spirituality then with that spirituality then when we form relationships those relationships we form not from a platform of insecurity but from a platform of security then we can actually be interdependent where two people in a relationship come together to make each other richer not financially richer but emotionally holistically richer so that vertical relationship which we have that can help us to address the issues that come in our horizontal relationships with greater maturity when that vertical relationship is there then that itself at a spiritual level addresses our loneliness because the more we practice bhakti yoga the more that spiritual loneliness goes away because we are connected with the divine 
of course we need relationships at a practical level and that psychological level of loneliness that we experience that we can overcome if we move from dependence towards independence and from independence towards interdependence so generally speaking i'll conclude with two points now that when we are trying to when we feel lonely at that time we all have certain impulsive ways by which we try to deal with that loneliness say so some people when they feel lonely they start picking up their phone and start clicking on it you know watch some video just go on social media do this do that there are impulsive ways of dealing with loneliness and they may make us temporary they make us temporary feel good but you could say that these ways is watching some tv getting lost in entertainment these are like emotional pain killers the pain of loneliness we are just dealing with it by covering it up pain killers don't cure the disease they just cover the disease they numbers to the awareness of the pain that is being caused by the disease so pain killers if somebody keeps taking the disease will keep worsening sometimes pain killers may be needed but pain killers are meant to be a supplement to the main treatment not a substitute to the treatment the main treatment is the curative disease so we all have developed over time certain pain killers to deal with our negative feelings such as loneliness within us and we have to we need to observe these okay this is the behavior that i gravitate towards now is this really addressing my need is this actually making me better or is it simply covering up the issue and then we find out what is a healthier way to address that loneliness so that could be both at a spiritual level and a social level at a social level if in our social circle we find out that there's some person with whom when we relate you know we can open our hearts to them they open their hearts to us we connect with them well if there is any one person also like that we need to invest time in that relationship so that that relationship grows and if that person happens to be a spiritual person it's even better for us but if you can find out in every relationship there is some contribution that we make and there is some expectation that we have and sometimes some people we try to do so much for them and they just don't seem to care for us and when it happens you know we do one two two three four five six ten things we do for them and they just don't care for us we just feel frustrated we feel rejected but then there might be some other people in our life who actually care a lot for us but we take them for granted you know this person always there this person already to help me so you know in ultimate sense the universe is reciprocal if we give love we'll get love back but we we blind ourselves to that reciprocity by our expectations that means if i expect that this person should reciprocate with me and sometimes that person just doesn't reciprocate and they keep trying and keep trying and keep trying and you just get frustrated by that but then we look around okay who is a person who is wanting to connect with me and then we try to connect with that person so we may know we may feel oh this person is what i want this is the person whose affection i want whose attention i want but if we don't get it then we need to understand that ultimately whatever love whatever affection anyone offers us that affection is ultimately offered by the divine to us through them when a mother offers her breast milk to a baby it is a very intimate act of love but at the same time the mother doesn't do anything special to produce the breast milk when the baby is born the same divine who sends a child through her womb into the world also sends milk in her breast so that she can nourish the child so if we see it this way that whoever offers us any love any love yes that person may be loving us but along with that it is the divine who is offering their love to us through them so sometimes some relationships some channels don't work out 
but that same divine love can come to us in a few drops through some other channel so rather than reducing our relationships to our expectations we revise our expectations based on the reality of the relationships okay if this is not working out in this way i don't have to beat my head against it you know let me see where the relationship works out and in that way when we have openness that doesn't mean we reject existing relationships but different relationships work at different degrees of of proximity now i come from india which is a conservative culture so when we talk with people we keep a particular distance but in different countries i go different countries actually different distances are considered proper if you have too much distance people say why are you so rude in some countries you go you, you come too close they yeah, you are being so rude so in different countries people are comfortable with different levels of distances with each other so similarly when in different relationships different relationships work best at different levels of distance so it's not that if some existing relationship we are not getting reciprocation we have to reject that relationship but we may understand this relationship may function best at this level of distance and this much reciprocation i can expect from here and accordingly i can contribute accordingly in that relationship so at a horizontal level rather than reducing our relationships to our expectations we revise our relationships based on the reality of how people respond to us and secondly uh, if we can as i said so if, if that for some person who connects with us who reciprocates with us if we at a healthy level can connect with them that is a that is a more beneficial way to deal with loneliness so we can make a exercise uh, of ourselves after this talk okay who are the people with whom i can connect with if i need it they will have time for me sometimes we may have thousands of people connect with us on facebook but you know if we want to meet them face to face all of them are already booked <laughs> so that doesn't work so well so who are the people who to make can connect and we make a list of that and then we can try to when we feel that loneliness we can connect with somebody who is ready to reciprocate with us and secondly that is with respect to the horizontal relationship with respect to the vertical relationship we find out some activity by which we can connect with the divine and experience the presence of the divine for some people it might be just spiritual music just hear that music sing that music we feel good for some people it might be just a spiritual act of worship we pray meditate and we may experience an inner enrichment for some people it might be a visual connection there's a representation of the divine which we meditate on with our eyes and that helps us to calm our sense of loneliness for some people it might be through wisdom the way through the heart maybe for some people through the head so if they read some wisdom texts and reading them contemplating those texts that may bring the calmness so at a practical level when we start feeling lonely we can find out some spiritual activity that can help us connect with the divine and when we do this we have a way to develop the vertical connection and we have a working horizontal connection then that loneliness will not trouble us that much then that loneliness even if it comes it will stay for some time and it will go and over a period of time those phases when it comes and stays that will also start decreasing and then we will find that our life becomes enriched with relationships that are based not on our insecurities but based on our inner strengths we are independent another person is independent and together we form a relationship that is interdependent that enriches both of us <coughs> so this is how by by developing our spirituality we can not only experience the vertical connection but also develop our horizontal connections better so i'll summarize what i spoke i spoke on the theme of overcoming loneliness i started by talking about how when my mother passed away suddenly i started 
exploring what is the meaning of relationships what are what are what are relationships meant for and that's when i came across the bhakti texts which explained that the, there is a vertical relationship with the divine a horizontal relationship with others and whatever love we experience in our horizontal relationships that is there's a far greater love available in the vertical relationship with the divine and when you talk about loneliness you talk about circumstantial loneliness when you are physically alone that is easily you just go with people we can overcome it but there is psychological loneliness which comes when we are surrounded by people but we feel disconnected and that comes because inside us our mind is constantly making us feel a sense of loss our mind is defining us in terms of our loss the mind is like a software program which keeps giving us some prompts from within keeps popping up something from within so if we are defined ourselves in terms of particular relationships say as the child of someone as the spouse of someone as the parent of someone then if that relationship is not working or that relationship is uh, strained then that keeps nagging us from inside so the 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 loneliness that we feel is because we have defined ourselves in terms of a relationship and that's where we are feeling the loss so if we are in ocean waves will come right we cannot stop the waves we cannot find a place where there will be no waves rather we can have a vertical connection with a rope coming from the helicopter and that will ensure that we don't get battered by we don't that much thrown away by the waves so similarly that vertical connection for us is that connection with the divine with krishna the all attractive supreme i talked about this boy who was suicidal after a breakup initially but he started practicing bhakti yoga then immediate then even there was another breakup after a few years he became more spiritual what was a depressing experience what could have been a depressing experience became an enriching experience for him and so developing this vertical relationship can may help us to rise from dependence towards independence dependence means we define ourselves in terms of the approval that we earn from others uh, that's why any kind of disruption in that shatters us but independence means we understand the divine is always with us and we experience the presence of the divine as the calmness and the clarity that comes when we connect with the divine through the practice of bhakti yoga just as for a baby who is asleep even if she can't see her mother the comfort the coziness the warmth of the comforter indicates to her yes my mother is there and she loves me similarly we are spiritually blinded right now we are materially captivated and spiritually blinded like a person watching a horror movie on a in a theater and not being aware of the safety that they actually have so although we can't perceive spiritual reality right now but despite our closed eyes we can experience a spiritual serenity a spiritual calmness and that can be a pointer for us towards the divine who does care for us and when we form a relation when we are risen from independent dependence to independence through our spirituality then when we form a relationship it will be based not out of our inner insecurity but based on our inner security and then after that if we feel lonely then we can introspect to find out our uh, what are our unhealthy responses impulsive responses to deal with loneliness it might be mass entertainment excessive entertainment it might be blink binging on entertainment binging on eating binging on sleeping whatever and then identify them and try to rectify them these are these are simply emotional pain killers they don't they don't cure the loneliness they only cover the loneliness and to cure the loneliness i talked about how we can find a horizontal relationship where we are getting reciprocation it is not universe is reciprocal if we give, give love we'll get love but sometimes we expect the reciprocation on a particular channel from a particular person and when that doesn't happen we get frustrated so different relationships work at different distances so rather than trying to create greater proximity in a relationship where proximity is not happening we can look for where we can develop uh, we can get reciprocation and connect over there to deal with that loneliness and then at a vertical level we can find out that activity 
uh, which helps us experience the presence of the divine and through that th these two ways we can actually overcome the loneliness that we are experiencing through our spirituality thank you very much Are there any questions or comments? Yes, please. <clears throat> Is it easier to connect with the divine at the time of death than in life? I feel sort of isolated with the question in this room. I'm probably the oldest person in this room. Okay. And like your mother, I have cancer and I could not be around for a while. And, I mean, I've been around 45 years in the Hare Krishna movement and several and then Nidia's wife. And I've noticed that, uh, except for a few high-level gurus like Prabhupada, few people achieve much on the spiritual path. I mean, great at night, like Prabhupada or a few mm -hmm. others. OK. So is it easier to ex connect with the divine at the time of death? It's a relationship. There is no trick in that. No, it, it's, it's said in the Bhagavad Gita that if we remember the divine at the time of death, then we can attain the divine. The idea is that if we love God, if we love Krishna more than the world, then Krishna takes us beyond this world to him. There's no reason for us to stay with him. So we, when we approach death, uh, what is the disposition with which we are approaching it? That will define how much we can connect with God. Naturally, there is some fear, there is some sense of disappointment, there is, a, there is physical pain. There are a whole gamut of emotions that come. But along with that, also, if we understand that actually I am a spiritual being, I am a soul who is different from my body, then it's like, the body is going to go towards its inevitable destruction, but the soul is going to be elevated. I was coming to America from, in, from Australia a few months ago, and the person next to me was watching this action movie. And there they showed this, uh, this hero had been tied up by the, by the villain in a car, and then that car was just charging towards the cliff. And from the cliff was a huge fall. It was not a hero, it was a friend of the hero who was doing that. So then as the car just charged straight towards it, and just fell off the cliff. And then you heard the car crashing down from the cliff in a big explosion. He appeared to have died. But then as this villain was gloating, looking down at the car, this person is dead. He looked up and suddenly he saw above there's a helicopter. And the hero had actually thrown a lasso from the helicopter, caught the friend and had pulled him out. And he's reaching the helicopter. Now this is of course practically unrealistic. <laughs> it's a movie. But actually I was thinking this is very beautifully depicts how things happen. At death, the body will fall to its destruction. But the soul remains safe. The soul gets separated from the body and the soul rises to a higher destination. Now, how high the soul will go, that will depend on that person's consciousness. But the divine is always there with us. And at that time, if rather than obsessing over what we are losing, oh, why did this happen to me? Why did I get this disease? Why did, this, why did I have to lose all this? If we turn towards, connect, turn towards connecting with, turn towards the divine wholeheartedly, then it is very much possible that at that time we can deepen, intensify and uh, thicken our love for the divine. So actually, as you rightly pointed out, it's not easy. There is Srila Prabhupada and there have been many of his disciples who have actually faced this exam and several of them have been able to uh, face the situation of death very gracefully. There is a disciple of Prabhupada Giriraj Swami who has written a book called Many Many Moons. 
is it another book called life's final exam so life's final exam there he talks about not just many bhakti yoga practitioners who have experienced uh, who have faced death with great serenity and spirituality but even those who are connected with bhakti yoga practitioners say somebody was a, a devotee but their their mother their brother their friend their spouse who were not devotees how even their final exam final pa passing was spiritualized so the process does help us to grow spiritually now uh, rather than worrying about uh, either what we are losing or how others have gone through if you understand we have a personal relationship with krishna and krishna is there with us so if we can try to connect with him then we will find his experience enriching us it's definitely when there are no other options open for us at that time we can wholeheartedly devote ourselves to krishna much more effectively Does that answer your question yes thank you very well thank you yes please um, from my own experience uh, i find that my relationship with the divine comes through life's trials and errors and hardship that I've been through because uh, I wasn't raised with my family um, and it's made me a lot stronger from a child to now an adult um, because I've had to stand on my own two feet from a very young age mm. and had to I've seen life from a different perspective when I haven't had any support Um, but instead of using that as oh whoa well, it's me as an adult which I find a lot of adults look at their children and use it as an excuse as oh well I didn't have a father or I didn't have a mother or um, this is why I haven't reached whatever That's true. you know um, I see my past as something that had to take place in order for me to become the person that I am today rather than seeing it as a hindrance I see it as something that's made me evolve as an individual um, and sometimes I found that I've had to literally disconnect from worldly things like the television, uh, social media, telephone calls um, through my journey of awakening um, just to go within and deal with as you said loneliness um, and, and questions that I had in myself that I never had a father or mother to ask or an aunt or a grandparent. Um, I had to go within and do a lot of searching. Um, I found that bookshops became my teachers, um, especially under the self-help and psychology sections, like Deepak Chopra, um, Lawrence Byron, and it, the list goes on and on and on. Celestine Prophecy, that book came to me in a dream. I didn't actually know that it existed, and I put it in Google. Um, is it Sunstein Prophecy? I think it was Sunstein Prophecy. It was one of the books, anyway, um, that came to me in a dream. It said it's the power of following one's dream. Um, so I found since I've, um, since I started to go within, a lot of questions, a lot of answers have come to my questions through my daily life. And I find now I'm more in touch and tune with synchronicity and why things happen because I find that life is like a big jigsaw puzzle there's loads of pieces and once you become awake you start to see that everything is connected and you become like a child to the world because every day I see it as a gift and excitement I wake up with excitement because there's always something amazing that's going to happen to me that day or someone that I'm going to meet. And it always connects because once I say my prayers in the morning or whatever time, I pray most of the time and ask for, for guidance, I find it the more um, connected and that I've become, the more I'm finding answers that are coming constantly into my life where I'm no longer feeling like, I used to way back in the day as alone, oh well I don't have family I don't have this, everybody else has do you know what I mean, whereas now I feel complete, I don't feel I need to be in a relationship to feel complete, I don't, you know even though it would be nice when I finally meet a soulmate, but right now I'm complete in myself and really happy in my single life and as an individual who's not like most other people who have 
all that support. So yeah, I would definitely say um, finding the divine yeah, is when you've gone through mm -hmm. a lot in your life, it, it connects you more so. I would say trials and tribulations connect you because you start asking questions and you go within. Some people take their lives and end it and so they can't deal with it. But with myself, I would, I would definitely say trials and tribulations have brought me close to the divine. So I guess when it comes to death, like you said, I'll be totally at peace because death doesn't frighten me. To me, I just see it as a, a, a second chapter of evolve, you know, evolving to, the, to a higher ascension. Hey, beautiful. Thank you for sharing your story. Thank you. Part lecture, Thank you. part two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for us, adversity is often the strongest impetus for spirituality. And when we look at other trials that we go through, often when we look at our life, we look at the present and plan the future. But the divine looks at the present, at the future and plans the present. So when we are going through that fire of tribulation, of loss, of loneliness, why is this happening to me? We just may not understand that. Because we are looking from the present to the future. But as you rightly pointed out, the person who you become in the future, that is a person who has gone through that and that was the purpose. So for our growth, if we can look at our situations from a bigger perspective, the problem is there right now. And when the problem is there, we can't deny it. So we may have to live with pain, but we don't have to live in pain. With pain means there's a loss in my life, I acknowledge it. I don't deny it, I don't try to cover it up, but I don't obsess over it. It's a part of me, it doesn't, it's not the whole of me. And that way, every single thing that we, we are all on a journey of spiritual evolution. And in this journey of spiritual evolution, everything that happens to us can be a spur for us to grow. The universe can be like a university. But we need to be in a learning mood. If we are in a resenting mood, then we just can't learn anything at all. And that learning mood means we are ready to put our expectations aside. That's so if you do, it's wonderful. So thank you for sharing once again. Yeah, you want to say something, please? Love that. Um, two months ago, they found something in my brain. So I had to go back to friend to do a surgery. Um, and it's a risky surgery. With the doctor told me there's one chance on two to die. So it was intense. Um, so it's a spiritual journey to face death. And I had to make mistake. But it was very hard. I was very angry on myself. Maybe too much angry on myself. Why it happened to me? my wife and um, so much anger arise that I feel like I face all my demons and I forgot to love myself and I forgot to go back to love so after long meditation and facing demons I forgot that I didn't accept that part so I think the biggest thing is to accept when there's death in front of you and then there's demons Love it, because the more you're going to reject, like, oh, why, why? You're, you're nourishing anger more. And hatred, never <coughs> really come back with hatred, but by love. So I had to learn how to love this part of me, this dark side. Um, and then I'm always knew that I was a spiritual being living in, a, uh, in Earth, this journey. Um, mm -hmm. So I always knew that my soul will never die. Soul never die. The divin divinity never dies. It's eternal. The most painful thought thing that I thought was the loved one. How are they gonna deal if I die? I have to deal with that. How my parents, my sisters, my friends gonna deal with that? So I was at peace because I knew that. We all have a soul mission, 
You didn't change that for nothing. I'm hundred percent sure for that. So if I die, my existence on this planet will teach people about their own spiritual journey. You know. So I was at peace. I was at if I die, they're gonna learn. Everyone that I love and that I touch gonna grow from my death. And it's a miracle I survived the, the uh, surgery. Everything went well. You seem um, to be healthy now. You're okay? Yeah, I'm good. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. So congratulations for that. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, it's, it's about expectation, I think. Acceptance. Yeah. That death is not a bad thing. And I think that in our culture, we see death as something bad. Yeah. We should not. And there's some culture where they celebrate that, where they celebrate the life of that person. That's we true. We should do that instead of like mourning the crown mm -hmm. on the death of that person. So, yeah. I Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, actually, acceptance can be very emotionally empowering. Mm -hmm. Often, resentment of reality hurts more than reality. If say we are supposed to go for outing somewhere with friends and just the previous night we fall sick, we get a flu. Now flu itself is not very painful. But the resentment, oh everybody is on that outing and they are enjoying and I am lying on this bed. Life is so unfair to me. That resentment of reality hurts more than reality. So if we can accept that resentment can go away by that. And how do we accept that? And as I mentioned, can, if we can just keep our expectations aside. We are here, the reality is here, our expectations are here. And our expectations often help us to shape the reality. That means if I want to buy a new house, then I have a certain expectation. Okay, I want this kind of house, I want this kind of If I want to construct a house, this is how I want to construct it. So sometimes our expectations help us to shape the reality. But sometimes, if reality itself takes a different shape, then our expectations can come in the way of our dealing with reality. So, if somebody has wanted to learn rowing, learn, riding in a boat and rowing, and then they invited their friends. Let's see how I've learned my rowing. They're going to celebrate and demonstrate. Yeah. And then as they start rowing, suddenly a monster wave comes over there. And they had, they had planned, you know, ele elegantly, gracefully, they were moving their hands, their legs, and going to row, and everybody is going to see. But now, with the wave having come, there is no boat and there are no, there are no oars in their hands. And if they still keep rowing, they'll sink. At that time, okay, all I have to do is, okay, you know, recalibrate, okay, how do I deal with it now? Now, I have to just swim, paddle and get to the coast. So sometimes reality just changes everything in such a way that our expectations are no longer fulfillable. So if we are here, our expectations are here, reality is here. The pain is not just caused by the reality. The pain is caused by the distance between the expectation and the reality. So if we can Put the expectation aside. Okay, that's not. Um, I can no longer swim right now. I can no longer row right now. So why can't I row? Why did this wave have to come? Why is my boat gone? Where am I over gone? Okay, think about all that afterwards. Right now, get to the shore. So similarly, if we are just too caught in how life should have been, then we we can't at all connect with life as it is. And not only can we not connect with it, life as it is may not be as bad as we think. But when we just compare life as it is with life as we wanted it to be, that distance makes it often seem worse. So by acceptance, what happens is this middleman of expectations we put aside. Okay, I am here, the reality is here. Let's deal with it. But as long as the middleman of expectations is coming in, that expectation sucks all our energy. And then we can't deal with reality at all. It's like if you wanted to construct a house and you had a you hired some middleman who would want to construct it for you. 
and that pedal man keeps taking your money but doesn't do anything on the ground he keeps demanding give me more money give me more money it will not work just put the middle man aside and get down and start working on the house yourself so i feel that if you can just as she said make a learn to accept put aside resentment then reality can be navigated much more gracefully rather than painfully okay thank you amen thank you yes you yeah. yeah. Thank you very much for your participation. Hey Krishna. How are you?